Okay, so then uh, let's start with um, lecture. Uh, so first lecture of module two. So again, um, this uh, lecture is under the Creative Commons license. It means that you are free to uh, copy and distribute uh, the work under the same license. So um, the lecture is um, named Finding Overrepresented Pathway in GeneList. And uh, during this lecture, what we are going to do is we are going to cover the, the theory beyond the tools that we are going to use. And uh, we do that because we think if you understand how the tools are working, then it's going to, be going to be easier for you to choose the right tools after the workshop because there are many enrichment tools that exist for pathway network analysis. So uh, then you can choose the tool that is the best for your data and project. And uh, also um, for you to, um, it's going easier for you to adjust the parameters and to choose the best parameters. And at the end uh, to correct uh, and correctly interpret your data. So uh, first is the concept. So this one uh, our le lecture and then it is going to be followed by a practical lab. And in the practical lab, we are going to use two tools called um, GProvider and GSEA. So let's start by the general workflow of uh, enrichment analysis and some definitions. So we have several learning objectives during this lecture. So um, I hope that we will be able to understand the difference between a defined gene list and a ranked gene list, the concept of p-value and FDR in the context of pathway enrichment analysis, and to be able to understand the output of an enrichment test. So here is the general uh, workflow of pathway enrichment analysis to illustrate, uh, sorry, to illustrate uh, the general concept. So we can see that we have uh, three steps. So uh, for the first step, this is where we get our hits from our omics experiment. So uh, in this uh, first step, this is where we use statistical analysis to estimate which data points, gene, proteins, or lipids in our experiment is going to be uh, different from the background noise. So basically, if we have uh, RNA-seq data, this is where we select our genes that are uh, differentially expressed, significant. And uh, so in this step number one, this is where we try to remove uh, as much noise as possible. So our advice is that you take a lot of uh, care when you do this step one, so you don't carry the noise in your pathway analysis. And the step two is really um, the focus of um, this current module. This is where you use a bioinformatic tool to interpret your data. So um, this is where you do the pathway enrichment analysis. So to do it, we query our list of genes against some um, biological processes stored in databases. And um, that's the biological processes, this is what we call the, like the pathway. So that's why we say pathway enrichment. But uh, sometimes in your project, you may also use uh, other information. So you can in use information uh, about disease or drug targets, drug targets or transcription factors that are also stored in this uh, databases. So uh, at the end of step two, then you will have your list of uh, enriched pathway. And this is when we do the network visualization uh, to uh, better interpret the results and uh, actually it's an opening. So after the, the network visualization, usually we generate new hypothesis. And uh, this is also where we need to validate. So once we have our new hypothesis and new pathways of interest, we go back to the bench work and we try to validate the, our pathways of interest using a drug or an enzyme uh, inhibitors. Uh, so this is here how the module integrates uh, with the full uh, workshop. So Gary talked about um, today and in the pre-recorded video, talked about the gene list, how to get your gene list and, and the, the dif different uh, pathway database and some example of pathway analysis. And so for the pathway enrichment, we start with these two elements. The first element is the gene list. So as I said, coming from uh, your statistical an analysis where you remove your noise. And the second element is the pathway uh, that comes from prior knowledge stored in this um, pathway database. 
And so uh, here I put gene set. So the gene set is a format uh, to store the pathway information. So if basically, if we say cell cycle, so the gene set cell cycle will be the name cell cycle and containing all the genes that are known to be involved in the cell cycle. And now for um, in your analysis tools for gene list and gene set to talk together, you need to uh, use the gene uh, the same gene identifiers. So this is sometimes a common mistake that we are uh, doing. But if your gene list you 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 have your gene symbols in your gene list, so pay attention that the database that you're using it's formatted formatted as gene symbol. If you're using um, ensemble ID in your gene list, that make sure that your pathway database is formatted as ensemble as uh, we're using ensemble ID. So then we are doing the pathway enrichment analysis. And so we are looking for over enrichment of some pathways in our gene list, and we are doing it to interpret the data in an unbiased way. So this is module two. And after we will do the visualization using Cytoscape, and we will also see in the other mod modules how, how it is very possible with Cytoscape to integrate multiple layers of information. So here is another represent, representation of pathway analysis, uh, because something we sometimes we can think it's uh, a bit complicated, but it's actually just an, a way to organize our gene list into some categories. So I have my gene list on the left here, and uh, yeah, it could be that within my genes, in my gene list, um, these genes belong to different categories. So I have the genes in black that might um, be part of the axon guidance pathway, the genes in green that are part of aging, the genes in purple that are part of stem cell development, and the other one in blue, cell migration. So what I have done is I have summarized my gene list into four biological functions. So it's way much, it's way easier for me to now try to find new hypotheses for my model and generate it like new experiment to do because I just have to focus on these four functions instead of looking at my fire genes. But we understand that the need uh, to perform, perform pathway analysis on a gene list is that because the gene list is large enough, we need to summarize. If you start with a very small gene list, you may need to interpret it in other ways and pathway analysis might not be uh, the best way for you. And we are going to see tomorrow with some protein protein interaction network that you could do. So this slide illustrates the concept of overlap that is used to calculate the enrichment score when, when we talk about over representation analysis. So now we have the same gene list on the left and it's here. So the gene list has 41 genes. And so we are testing a pathway called axon guidance. So we want to see if our axon guidance in, is enriched in our gene list. So what we see here is that the original size of the pathway is 39 genes. So in the, in the original, original pathway database, this pathway has uh, 39 genes. And the overlap meaning that the genes that are in common between my gene list and my pathway is 13. So overlap size is 13. Not what we can see is that 13 divided by 39, this is about one quarter. So one quarter of the pathway is in the overlap, which in, it's, it's quite large. And the, for the gene lists, it's the same. So about one quarter of the gene list is shared with this pathway. So let's say this is, the first uh, measurement and the first start to calculate the enrichment analysis. So in addition to the simple concept of overlap, what we can also add sometimes in, in, in some method is a score associated with the genes. So it could be for, uh, um, for example, for rna seq you could use the score of the differential expression and then you can rank your genes from high score to low score. And this score is going to take to be taken into account when you recalculate the enrichment score, depending on the method. And another element that is important when you do uh, pathway enrichment analysis is the concept of background. So the background is all the genes here that I, uh, we could measure during our experiment. So if we do like uh, RNA sequencing and we work on the like the whole genome, then the background could be all the genes in the genome. But uh, if we have, for example, a custom array, 
like where, where we put only on the array immune genes, then we only could measure immune genes. So then the background should be reduced only to those genes. So it's a very important concept. So for an RNA-seq, usually we, we, we use the, like the whole genome, but I, I would say that more accurately, we could reduce the background to only the genes that are expressed um, in our model. So we could remove the, 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 the genes with zero count or low count. Okay, so some definitions. So when we speak about overrepresentation analysis, sometimes we say that the pathway is over overrepresented in our genome list, or we say the pathway is enriched in our genome list. So simply, it's just it it just means that there are several or many genes from this pathway in our genome list. But a more accurate definition would be that there are more genes from this path pathway in our genome list than what we could have obtained by chance only. So in this second part of the lecture, we are going to learn about enrichment analysis using a defined gene list. So that brings us to the outline of this lecture, which describes the workflow of an enrichment analysis. So we see that there are two workflow. And uh, so we have two workflow because we can have a workflow if we have a defined gene list and another workflow if we have a ranked gene list. So if we have a defined gene list, then the statistical test that we are going to use is the Fisher's exact test. And if we have a ranked gene list, then the tool that we are going to use is GSEA, which uses a rank sum test. But um, the output is very similar. And the output on enrichment analysis is a p-value that is associated which of, uh, with all, each of the tested pathways. And uh, then because we are testing many pathways at the same time, we need to correct for multiple hypothesis testing. And uh, so in, during the lecture, we are going to see the calculation of the bond ferroni correction as well as the false discovery weight. So what is the difference between a defined gene list and a ranked gene list? So a defined gene list is typically a fixed number of genes. So you could have selected 200 or 500 genes. So a typical uh, example would be um, like uh, you have selected genes that are frequently mu mutated across some patients. And the question that you are going to ask is, are any pathways surprisingly enriched or depleted in my gene list? Usually it's enriched. Usually we say, are any pathways surprisingly enriched in my gene list? And the statistical test is going to be the Fisher's exact test. Now, uh, a rank list, and we will see that is recommended if you can. A rank list is a list of all genes in a genome that you were able to rank using a score that is coming out from your omics experiment. So a typical example for rank list could be RNA-seq example. When you compare two groups, treated and controlled, you can rank all genes using the differential expression score for, from top up-regulated up to top down-regulated. So the, questions that, the question that you are going to answer in this case is, are any pathways ranked surprisingly high or low in my ranked uh, list of genes? And what we are going to see, to see is the tool GACA, and we are also going to talk briefly about the Wilcoxon rank sum test. So we are going to start example one for the defined gene list. And so for this example one, the data that um, we are taking are from a single cell proteomics data, and you have the reference here of the paper. Um, uh, about this data set. So for this data set, uh, we use a cell line that is um, derived from a patient with acute myeloid leukemia, which is a type of blood cancer. And so this is the flow cytometry plot. And uh, so what we see in this plot is that within this cell line, it's actually a mix of population, we have three groups. So the first group, is the LSE, leukemic stem cells. It's um, very primitive cells. And we have the progenitors, which are intermediate cells. And then we have the blasts, which are more mature cells. And so all these cells are going to be analyzed at the single cell level. So the, using proteomics, all the proteins are extracted from the single cell. And then at the end, uh, we, 
we have uh, for each cell all the proteins that were detected with their abundance, and we can use the same technique as for our uh, single cell RNA seq. We can uh, cluster uh, and group our cells. So we can see here on this two dimensional graph, which is a U map, we can see that we have uh, four groups of cells. So for this example, we are going to be interested in cluster A and cluster B. So you see now uh, here on the left, this is the matrix of the cells and concerning all the proteins that were detected. So the cells are the columns and the proteins are the rows and the value here are the protein abundance. So what we can do now that we have done this clustering is label our cells uh, using the cluster labels. So we are going to cluster the cells that belong to cluster A, and we are going to label the cells that belong to cluster B. So this is the matrix here, this uh, blue and red matrix. So we put all the cells from cluster A on the left and all the cells from cluster B on the right. So what we can do here is uh, apply um, the tools that are for RNA-seq to calculate differential expression. So we are going to calculate the differential expression between our cluster A and cluster B to get our two protein list. So uh, for this one, we use the, um, the Surat pipeline and the function find markers to, to find our list of uh, proteins. So we have a protein of four cluster B and a, uh, a list for cluster A. And this is the two list that we want to functionally analyze. We are and do some pathway enrichment analysis on it. So we use the tool gProfiler. So we just copy and paste our gene list into gProfiler. gProfiler give us the list of enriched pathway that were significant. And then later on, we will do um, the network visualization. So the next slide is we are going to see how gProfiler works to do this enrichment. So as I said previously, the first step of overall representation analysis will be to find the overlap between the gene present in our gene list and the pathway database. So the pathway database is a very important element. So um, I wanted to show you the structure and during the lab, you will, you will have some pathway database, like some GMT file. So you can open them in text editor. It might be too, too big to open in Excel, but try to open in Excel in a text editor so you understand the structure. So it's basically like the first columns are the, the names of the pathways and then the genes that are associated with each pathway. And so what we, we do is that we look for the overlap between the genes in the pathway and our gene list. So we see here in yellow for this pathway, I think it's regulation of transcription, that we have four genes that are in this pathway and in our gene list. So that's what we are doing. We are looking for each of the pathway for the overlap and we count the overlap size. And when I say we are doing, actually the tools are doing this for us. So now we are slowly getting into more details on how the simple enrichment test works. So we have our gene list here in pink. So it's 41 genes, if you remember from my, the first example. And the pathway that we were testing, I think it was axon guidance, at 39 genes. And the overlap size was uh, 13 genes, so 13 genes in common. So that was the first step. But now we go to the second step. And the second step is we need to find a way to calculate if we can get the same overlap size or a larger overlap by chance only. And uh, we do that to be able to calculate the p-value because the results of the enrichment analysis is a list of p-value associated with each of the pathway. So what we could do at that point is, do, is to do random permutation. So we could do 1,000, um, generate 1,000 random gene list, calculate the overlap for each of these random gene list and the pathway that we are testing, that will help us to build the null distribution. And then we will see if our observed overlap of 13 is higher than the null distribution. Because in this case, we think that if it's way higher than the null distribution, then the enrichment is not to be likely to happen by chance only. 
So uh, when we do that, we say that we call, uh, we calculate an empirical p-value, and this is the formula that is here below. So the p-value is assessing the probability that the overlap between our gene list and our pathway is observed by chance only. So a p-value can range from zero to one. If the p-value is close to zero, zero, there is a low chance that the results are caused by random chance only, and we can be confident to report the pathway as enriched. But if it's one, the p-value is one, it's likely due to random chance. So that zero is good, we keep it, and one is bad, and we don't take this pathway into consideration. So the problem with the random permutation is that it takes time. It can be, uh, it takes time and uh, it could be also res resource uh, intensive for the computer. So which is good in the, in the case of this uh, simple enrichment test is, is that in, instead of doing the random permutation, we can use a statistical test because uh, we can model the null distribution use, using the hypergeometric -geome probability distribution. So, and the, um, the test that is using the hypergeometric probability distribution is the Fisher's exact test. So, here is the, um, here is the hypergeometric probability distribution, and it measures so the probability for each of these keys. So this case is, um, is like 5,000 red balls that we will adapt for the path management analysis to say that it's 5,000 genes. And what we can see here is that we have black balls and then we say it's genes that are in the pathway that we are testing, like the axon guidance pathway. So what we see here is that we have way more uh, red genes than black genes. And this is our gene list. So we pick five randomly, five uh, five balls, five genes, and the result that we got was a four black ball and one red ball. So I think we understand intu intuitively that it was not um, easy to get this re this result. So if we get this result from the first time, then it's not very likely. But we can using the hypergeometric probability distribution, we can uh, assess the probability in an exact way. So for example, here, the probability to have zero black ball is very high. Uh, yeah, zero black ball is very high, it's 0 0.6. And then we get the probability to get one black ball and four red balls, which is lower. And then the probability to get four black ball and one red ball is very low. It's actually 0 0.001. And then from this probability, we can derive the p-value by summing up these two um, probability. And so the p-value to get four black ball and one red ball is actually 0 0.001. So we know that uh, it's very low. So we can conclude that this pathway, this black pathway, is significantly enriched in our gene list and it's probably not due to random chance. <clears throat> so to calculate the Fisher's exact test, what we can do if we don't use tools, we can um, build like a two by two tables. And um, so the numbers that are going to be entering the formula would be the size of the overlap. So the overlap between your gene list and the pathway, the, the, the pathway size, so the number of genes that were in the pathway, but not on, in the overlap, and also um, the number of genes that were not in the pathway, not in the overlap. And the fourth uh, number is the, the, the background size. So all these four elements are going to be entered in the formula. So I'm just showing to you to you understand that these four factors are important for the p-value. So this is what uh, we are seeing there. So GProviler is going to calculate all of that for us. And what is important, so this is the output of GProviler with, with the cluster B list. So I just uh, copy and paste uh, the cluster B list from the single cell proteomics example into GProviler. And this is the top four pathways. So these were the top four pathways that were significantly enriched. And we look at the statistics here. So we have, a column called term, a column called a query, and T and Q. So term 
is pathway. So these numbers are the original size of the pathway. So the number of genes in the pathway that were tested. And query is the size of my gene list. So my gene list was uh, 51 genes for cluster B. And the overlap for this one was 21 genes. So 21 genes uh, were in common between my gen gene list and the pathway. And the, the other one, as I said, was the background. So here we, we see the background to be uh, 21,000 genes. And actually this is because we use the default background. But as I was telling you for the single cell proteomics, maybe we did not measure all the genes in the genome. We just could identify a portion uh, of the genomes. Like we only uh, a portion of proteins were identified. So I think it would have been more accurate to reduce the background to only the proteins that were detected at this one cell. But this is your decision. So each time you have a project, you need to think about your data and your project and tell yourself, do I use the, the full background or do I, do I upload a custom background because I could not measure uh, the full genome. So there is an option you will see in Gprofiler to upload your custom background. So now we are going to see the differences between this four top pathway and which elements of the four elements that I told you are important for the p-value calculation. So the first actin filament has the lowest p-value, so the most significant. And what we see is that the overlap is 21. So there is like 21 genes in this overlap. So the other one, they just have an overlap of 10. So we think that the overlap size here was the main factor for this pathway to get the lowest p-value. But now what is the difference between these three pathways? The, the, the three pathways have an overlap of 10. So the difference is the size of the original pathway. So this one has the lowest p-value and you see that the size of the, the the original pathway was 408, 408. but uh, this one was, uh, the original size was bigger. We have like seven and 788. So if we do the ratio, the ratio 10 divided by 310 divided by 700, the first one has a higher value. So that's why we get a lower p-value. So I'm showing this to you so that you understand the results and you just, you don't, only look at the p-value, but you also look at your overlap size and your uh, pathway size to, at the end, make the decision uh, for you to keep this pathway or not to keep this pathway in your further uh, analysis. And this is the difference between so the first one, active actin filament pathway, which is the, the, the most um, significant, and two pathways that were not significant. And this one, you see that for, for sure the overlap was very small. So we have a gene size of four for this one and overlap of one for this one. So when you have a very small overlap, then even if the p-value is like on, on the edge, almost significant, well, you have to be very careful with this. So the p-value assesses the probability that the tested pathway is enriched in our gene list by chance only, but we are testing many pathways at the same time. Therefore, we need to correct for multiple hypothesis testing, and that's, that's what we are going to see in the next slides. And uh, just a note to, to, to tell you that Gprofiler had put the adjusted p-value directly. So that's why I, I've like I copy paste the p-value myself that I calculated, because in Gprofiler, we don't see the nominal p-value. So why do we need to uh, correct for multiple hypothesis testing? So we go back to our example of um, red balls and black balls to, to uh, explain it. So you remember that it was very unlikely to get this result by chance only. We got four black ball and one red ball. I think the p-value was, if I remember, 0 0.001. And 0 0.001 is not zero it means that there is still a chance to get this randomly by chance only. And it can happen if you try multiple times. So if I tell you, well, try until you get these results, maybe you will pick five balls 10,000 times. And at one point you will get uh, four black balls and one red ball. So even if it's unlikely, then if you repeat the test, then you can get the chance to get it. So that's why we, 
we uh, need to correct for multiple uh, hypothesis test testing. And if we don't do that, we are going to increase the number of false positive in our results. So there is actually a, a simple way to correct for multiple hypothesis testing. And intuitively, you could think about it yourself is to multiply the p-value that you got by the number of pathway that you have tested. And this correction exists. This is the Bonferroni correction. And we are going to see how it works. So we have the, so you remember the, the, this four pathway coming from this cluster B uh, example, they were significant and this one, they were like barely significant. So 349, it were the total number of pathway in the database. So total of, uh, they were not all significant, but this in the original database, there were 349, a pathway, so we multiply the nominal p-value by this number to get the adjusted p-value. So what I would like you to understand is that the adjusted p-value is always going to be larger than the nominal p-value. And this is also our goal when we want to correct for multiple hypothesis testing. And this one that they were, they were barely significant, now they are equal to one. Uh, Bonferroni is very stringent, so it's a good correction, but it could be that when you apply it, none of the pathway passed the significance threshold. So there is another met method that is widely used and it's called the false discovery rate. So the false discovery rate is the expected proportion of the observed enrichment due to random chance only. So let's say you have a FDR of 0 0.05. It means that you are going to select the, the list of pathway, maybe you are going to have 30 pathway that pass this threshold of FDR 0 0.05 or less. And it means that in this pathway, you have a probability that 5% of them are due to random chance only. So the method that we are going to see now to calculate the FDR is called the benjamin holberg procedure, and the result is a Q value. So, so we go back to our example of uh, with the cluster B cell. So we had a third, so 349 tests, yeah, pathway. So I showed you the top four and I showed you the, the, the bottom two that were not significant. So the first step when you calculate the FDR is to rank all the pathway using the nominal p-value. So with the small p-value at, at the top and the large p-value non-significant at the bottom. And then we start to calculate our adjusted p-value. So the same as the Bonferroni correction, we start by multiplying by the number of pathway, 349. But now what we are also doing is we divide by the rank. And divide by the rank, so the difference with the Bonferroni is that we are now going to correct the p-value in a more stringent way for the p-value that are at the top. So the, like the p-value that are very significant are going to be more corrected than the value at the bottom that are not significant. That's why um, Benjamin Holberg is more permissive than Bonferroni. So then when we have this adjusted p-value, then the last step is to get a q-value uh, from the adjusted p-value. So it's basically kind of the same as the adjusted p-value. We go row by row. We start from the bottom, so 0 0.06 is the same here. But for example, for this one, let's say we want to calculate this Q value. We look at the row here and the row below. And if the row below is, has the smallest p-value compared to this uh, same row, then we take it. And uh, we do it like this until rank number one. So this is uh, how we get our FDR. So again, the tools are doing us this for us, but we need to understand the theory behind it. So, um, so once we have the Q value, we select the pathway with our threshold, let's say FDR 0.05, or we can be more stringent. We can uh, select all the pathway under FDR 0.01 and continue with our analysis. And again, this is the output of G profiler. So I think that now you can understand all the terms and um, the FDR is here. If you chose the, the method here, because in G profiler, you can use Bonferroni, uh, Benjamin Holberg or another method that they have for us. 
So, so really my goal is that now you can use any enrichment tools that exist, look at the output and understand the results. So this is the output table of another tool called Enrichor. And then we can see if we recognize all the elements. So one element will be the list of the pathways. And we see that this pathway, they are coming from the gene ontology database. Then the other important element is the overlap. So the overlap size between your gene list and the pathway that has been tested. So it's here, it's 85. And then the second here in this case would be the size of the original pathway. So they show us the ratio between the, the overlap and the pathway size, because we know it's important for uh, for the result of the p-value. And here, the second column is the nominal p-value, and the third column is the adjusted p-value. And this is this column that we are going to, to take to select our pathways that are enriched. And this column here, uh, it's also nice when the tools, they have it, they have the name of the genes that are in the overlap for each pathway. Okay, so let's try another one. So I hope that uh, now you can recognize the element. So Panther is another tool. What we have, the list of the pathways, the origin of the database, I think it's the GoSlim from Panther. And then we must have like a measure of the overlap, which is this column. So overlap between your pathway and your path pathway and your gene list, and then the original size of the pathway. And then we have the p-value, but most importantly, we have the FDR column, and this is this column that we are going to use to select our enriched pathway. So now we have finished to explain the enrichment analysis using a defined gene list. But at the beginning, I told you that there are two protocols, where, one for the defined gene list and one for the ranked gene list. And also we told you that whenever you can have a ranked gene list, then it's it's recommended to use the, the rank gene list protocol. So the main step for the rank gene list is to generate first a rank list. We are going to see how to do it. And then the tool that we are using is GACA, which uses a rank sum test. So a white test enrichment in rank gene list, it's to avoid the, the problem of selecting the genes using an arbitrary threshold. So if you have a differential expression analysis and you want to select your genes, if you are too permissive and you select your genes in a very stringent way, what's going to happen is that you're going to lose a lot of information. But at the contrary, if you are um, not permissive enough and then you, you select uh, a lot of genes with like a FDR, I don't know, uh, zero point uh, zero six, which should, you should not. But um, then, what you are going to do is to allow too many false positive in your data. But if we, you, if you have a method that uses a rank gene list, you don't have to select your genes, so you avoid this issue, and this is why it is recommended. So for this example number two, using a rank gene list, so we have a different data set example, and this. This uh, example comes from bulk RNA sequencing, and the reference paper is here below. So we are working with uh, blood cells, normal blood cells, and what we are doing in these blood cells, we are overexpressing a transcription factor called TFAB. So now we have two conditions, the control and the treated, and the treated, which is here, OE, is the condition where we overexpress the transcription factor. So what we can do here is to create a rank, a rank file that will rank our genes from top up regulated to top down regulated. And which is very important is that we leave the genes that are not significant in the middle of the rank file. And then we, this is, so the rank file is the input format for GACA. So we input the rank file into GACA. GACA gives us the list of the enriched pathway we create a network for visualization. And in this case, and uh, in this paper, at, uh, from the enrichment map, we focused on two particular pathways, which were the lysosome and um, the MIC targets. So that's to show you the, like, like a workflow example. So the first step is to create this rank gene list. So how do we do that? So here we have the example of bulk uh, RNA sequencing. 
So we have a matrix with our uh, samples that treated, our samples are controlled. So we use differential expression analysis using our package like uh, de 2 or Azure and uh, using um, the output of the differential expression, we rank our genes from top upregulated in treated to top down regulated in treated using leaving the non-significant genes in the middle. So what um, the, the score that we are using to do this rank, we obtain it from this formula here, sine of the log for change multiplied by minus log 10 of the p-value. So basically, uh, for each gene, we have this log for chain column and this p-value column. So if a gene is very significantly differentially expressed, the p-value is going to be close to zero. So minus log 10 is going to transform this small number in a large number because we want a high score for this for these very significant genes. And then for the sign of the log for change, the log for change would indicate us if the gene has a higher expression in the treated versus control or lower expression. So basically the sign of the log for change tells us if the gene is upregulated or downregulated. So that's why we also use the sign of the log for change. So now we have this score for all the genes and we basically uh, uh, rank uh, all the genes from high to low. And um, we are going to select these two columns, like the gene name and the score to create the rank file in GACA. And we are going to see this uh, more in, also in the practical lab. So usually we create this rank file in R, but for sure you can do it in Excel as well. So the tool GACA, so it's Mutha et al. who developed the tool GACA in two. 2003, and they were studying, studying diabetes. And so they came out with the GSER algorithm that shows that showed the downregulation of the oxidative phosphorylation pathway in their model. And the particularity is that all the genes in the oxidative phosphorylation pathway, none of them were significantly differential expression. So if they had selected their genes using like a, like a threshold, they would have lost all those genes. But what happened is that all the genes in the oxidative phosphorylation pathway were downregulated with a subtle amount. But the addition of this subtle downregulation of each genes had a strong impact of the path on the pathway activity. And this is what the GAC algorithm could measure. And then they also did some um, experiments to validate this finding. So GSEA is using a modified kolmogorov smirnov test, which is a rank sum test, and we are going to see how it works. <clears throat> so now we have a gene list here. So genes that are ranked from high to, to low, so upregulated to downregulated using the score that we have calculated. It's important to understand that all the genes are in the rank five, so the non-significant genes are in the rank five. So now what we need to, to, to do is to understand that we rotate this rank five to put it horizontally here. So now the up genes are on the left and the down genes are on the right and the non-significant genes are in the middle. So uh, we are testing one pathway at a time. So here we are testi testing this pathway, which is antigen processing and presentation. And what we are going to see is that we have a lot of black bars here. So the black bar represent the genes that are in the overlap. So the genes that are uh, in my rank file and in the pathway that we are testing. And we see uh, like the density of the black bar towards the left of the rank file, meaning that this pathway is in which engines upregulated. And uh, so what we can see is that GACA is calculating a running sum. So the running sum is starting at zero and increase, it goes gene by gene. So gene one, gene two, gene three in the rank list. So if a gene in the rank list is in the pathway, the sum is going to increase a lot. If gene number two is not in the pathway, the sum is, is going to decrease slightly. So if you have a lot of genes that are in the pathway, what you are going to see is you are going to see that your running sum is going to increase very rapidly. And the maximum uh, of this would be what is called the enrichment score. So this is how GACA is working. And also 
GSC as a weight system. So there, the, there, there is more weight for the genes at the very top or the very end of the rank file. So it means that we cannot have a peak. It's not possible to have a peak in the region of the genes that are not differentially expressed. This is how it works. And this is a zoomed image so of the GSC running sum so that you can uh, see better that. So this is gene one, gene two, gene three, gene four of the rank five. So each time the gene is in the pathway, the running sum increase and then decrease likely because it's not in the pathway and then increase again. So when there are a lot of genes in the pathway, the running sum is increasing rapidly. So uh, you can have in GACA positive and uh, a negative enrichment score. So we can see these two plots here. So the first plot, so it's a positive enrichment score. It means that the genes are enriched in the upregulated genes. So the left part of the rank five. And this plot on the right, is, uh, it's a negative enrichment score. It means that the genes are enriched, the pathway is enriched in genes downregulated. So now we have the enrichment score, but we still need to assess the significance. So we need to go from the enrichment score to a p-value. So GACA is doing this by, um, by random permutation to build a null distribution and to calculate an empirical p-value as I explained uh, at the beginning. So in the case that we are using most of the time, the permutation is done by replacing the genes in the pathway. So each pathway, we will do 1,000 random permutation. And then uh, so the pathway will now contain random genes. But there is another permutation technique that consists of shuffling the samples from the beginning before creating the rank file. So you also can do like basically 1,000 random rank file to break gene dependency. So, uh, so now, so for each of the random genes that we've tested in the random pathway, we have an enrichment score like a random enrichment score, which built the null distribution. And now we have our observed uh, enrichment score. So let's say our um, enrichment score that is observed is 0 0.8, and the mean of the null distribution is usually zero. So what we want to assess is how far our uh, uh, observed enrichment, sc enrichment score is from the, the, the the mean of the null distribution so that we can assess like the p-value. So we do that by calculating the empirical p-value, by calculating how many times the observed score was greater than the random score. And so that's for the p-value, but we still need to correct for multiple hypothesis testing and GACA is calculating also an FDR from the normalized enrichment score. So, now that we have seen the workflow for the defined gene list and the, for the ranked gene list, uh, in this last part of the lecture, we will see if we can rank or not our gene list depending on the omics data that we have and how to choose a tool. So it's not exhaustive, but this is a few uh, examples that we have. So I'm going to start by the data that are easy, easier to rank. So first, the RNA-seq, so bulk RNA-seq data. This is the example I, I took for example two um, with the TFAB overexpression. So when you have bulk RNA-seq uh, data and your experimental design is controlled versus treated, then it's easy to do a rank file as I explained and you rank all the genes and you do, um, you can input this into GACA. It's also uh, possible to do in single cell RNA-seq data so you first, for example, you first cluster your cells. And I think it's, I mean, I find it easier when you have um, multiple biological replicates in your data. So let's say you have single cell RNA data, but you have uh, three biological replicates and you put all, all your replicates together, but you still know which one is replicate one, two, and three. And let's say you want to, um, to compare cluster A and B like we did. But what you what you do is that you you create like a pseudo bulk from the data, and you gather all the cells that were from replicate one cluster A, all the cells from cluster B replicate two, replicate three cluster B, and then you do do the same for cluster A. So now you have six column, three for the 
for the cluster A, three for the cluster B. And then you can apply the same technique as for bulk RNA sequencing, do your differential expression, create your rank list, and then do GSEA. Another one that also uh, where you can do a rank list is a label free proteomics. If you have a sufficient number of prote proteins, I would say 5,000 or more, then you also can apply the same uh, technique as for RNA-seq. You do your differential expression, treated versus control, and you create your rank list and your enrichment analysis. And this is three examples where I do not use a rank list, and I don't know if you have other examples yourself. So the first one is when the starting point is DNA. For example, uh, so you have data for somatic mutations or CNV, and what you get is a gene list of your genes that are frequently mutated um, in, in, in some cohort of patients. So in this case, it's just a defined gene list. There is no way to rank it. So in this case, I use um, the G profiler workflow. And another one is when I have bulk RNA-seq, but I don't have the experimental design control versus treated. What I have is a time course. So I have for my uh, sample, I have a time point at zero hour, 12, 24, 48 hours, and so on. And what we are looking in this case is the profile of genes. So for example, you, we can use the k-means clustering technique and we look at, we want to retrieve all genes that go up in my time course or all genes that go down. Um, or the genes that, that first go up and then go down. So we have different profiles. And for, from, from the k-means clustering, what we get is different gene lists. So it's really, let's say, three defined gene lists. So this one, I cannot rank them. And I use them in the G-profiler um, workflow. And another example, let's say you work with chip -seq data and you have a transcription factor. And basically, you have from the, the, the chip -seq output a bad file that contains the chromosome region for each of the peak uh, was detected. And um, so let's say you say, you, you know that your transcription factors is binding um, at the promoter regions of genes. So what you do is you associate your chromosome region. So your peak with the gene that, um, that is nearby because you are looking at the promoter regions. And at the end, then you have a list of genes which could be quite large with chip -seq data analysis of all the genes where you have a peak in the promoter region. So in this case, it's a defined gene list. And we have in module seven, we have an optional uh, module seven if you have chip -seq data um, that explain the workflow and um, a tool that, that is uh, good to use is called GREAT for the instrument analysis of chip -seq. And if you have other data in your project, then we can discuss can you rank it or do you, do you have to use the defined gene list protocol? So as I said previously, uh, we are presenting you a few tools during this workshop, but many other tools exist for instrument analysis. So they can be web-based uh, like G-Profiler. They can be included in Cytoscape apps. I think it's the case of Bingo and Clugo. They can be standalone application like GACA that you download uh, on your computer, or they can be uh, included in our packages in Python. So, but now I hope that at the end of this lecture, you understood that any of the tools, they, they will have a typical output which is this table of list of enriched pathways with the pathway names, the number of overlapping genes, the number of genes in pathway, the p-value, and most importantly, the adjusted p-value. And this is this column that you take to select your pathway that are enriched and to continue <coughs> your analysis. So usually, like you can have many pathways depending on your experimental design. You may have a lot of pathway in your output table that are significant, and sometimes it's not easy to understand this table. And what you can actually see when you just look at the table is that those pathways, they can share a lot of genes in common because they have uh, a related biological function. So that's why we, we do the network visualization to uh, see the interconnection between this pathway and it's easier to understand, and that's going to be in module three. So some questions that might guide you when you need to choose your tool. So first, does it cover your model organism? Some tool will just cover human and mouse, and some tools will cover like a lot of model organism. 
Is there a good choice of pathway database? Are the pathway database up to date? Which statistics do they use? So now you can recognize, is it for defined gene list? Is, is it for ranked gene list? Some tools, they have option for two. So you can choose any of them. Is this description of the statistics clear enough? Do you, look, do you like the output style? And can you connect with network visualization tools like Cytoscape? So I done here a little bit of a comparison, but also to tell you why we are using G-Profiler in this workshop. So does G-Profiler has updated database? Yes, they update it very regularly on a monthly basis, and they make sure that they use the latest version of Ensemble. The choice of database, yes, we will see that they have a good choice of database. You can use GoBP, you can use Reactome or uh, Wiki Pathway. And what is interesting is that what is very useful, sometimes you just want to, to choose one database. You just want to test your pathway with GoBP. But sometimes you want to combine the database, like you want to use Reactome and GoBP together to get more comprehensive results. And you can do it uh, with GProfiler covers multiple organism, yes. Possibly, possibility to upload your own custom database, yes. So that's very useful. So let's say you have your project and your, your own gene list, but you want to compare with another paper. You have another paper and they, they got the, the, the gene expression and they get like a signature, like a gene list signature. And you want to see in your data if you enrich, you also enrich in this signature. So you can, uh, built uh, like a small GMT file for this signature and you can upload into GProfiler and you can test the pathway enrichment for only this pathway of interest. So that's very useful as well. For sure, they correct for multiple hypothesis testing, uh, possibility to upload your background, custom background. So you remember for the single cell proteomics, we say that maybe the full genome is not the adequate background. So we could copy and paste the list of proteins that were detected uh, at least once in, in, in each in, in the cells to uh, reduce the background. So it's also possible. And uh, GProfiler is a web app. There is also an R package. And for sure, it's possible to connect it with such a skip enrichment map. Uh, so as uh, some final notes, we usually test over enrichment of the pathway in our gene list. So we want to see if like, many genes in this pathway uh, is in our gene list. Sometimes we, some people are interested in under enrichment. So basically they want to, to, to know which pathway are not present at all in the gene list. It's possible if you're interested. And the Fisher's exact test is often called in the tool to hypergeometry test. So if you look at the statistics, you, you look at the tool and you want to see, oh, are they doing the Fisher's exact test or not? And you see hypergeometric test. Usually it's an approximation of the Fisher's exact test. Sometimes they use Monte Carlo simulation to approximate the test. And um, some other tools in the same category will also use the binomial test or the chi quest test. Okay, so for rank list, I didn't find so many tools. So I'm listing two, GSEA and Panther. And uh, so um, GSEA is, is using the modified uh, KS test, whereas Pan Panther is using a Wilcoxon rank sum test, which is also very appropriate um, for uh, enrichment of pathway in rank list. Uh, for sure, they both do correct. They, they're both correct for multiple hypothesis testing. Uh, with GSCA, you can choose the database, the pathway database they are, that are ready for you in the MSIC database, but it's also, um, um, there is also the possibility to upload your custom GMT file. So the GMT file it, is the pathway database, and it's good because then you can uh, upload um, the GMT file that corresponds to your model organism. And, and there is the possibility to visualize the results with Cytoscape Enrichment Map. So I said that, uh, so I mentioned the Wilcoxon rank sum test. So, um, so Wilcoxon rank sum test is also interesting. So um, it's different from GSEA because it's non-parametric. So in the Wilcoxon rank sum test, only the order of the genes is important. So it's not the, the expression scoring, but it's just, you need to order the genes by one, two, three, four. It's just the order that is going to take into account and uh, what we are going to look for is a shift in the distribution. So for example, in red, this is all the genes from a pathway and we see that there is a shift to the right compared to the um, 
the, the null distribution of the older genes. And this is um, the shift of this distribution is because the genes in this pathway were all upregulated. So, uh, so then uh, as a summary, we have seen the Fisher's exact test for calculating p-value for defined GLNIST and GSEA or real coxon rank sum test for computing uh, enrichment p-value for rank GLNIST. So the recipe for defined GLNIST, um, then uh, first you define your GLNIST and your background, then you select the pathway that you want to test, and then you run your enrichment tests and you correct for multiple hypotheses. And for a ranked list, it's not very different except the first step where you create your ranked list. So the advanced topic that were not covered in this lecture is the, um, the test that we are mentioning are not uh, correcting for the correlation between gene set or the dependency of genes. Some statistical methods are trying to do that, but not the two, not really the two to uh, test that I'm mentioning. Some other tools are more advanced. They are topology aware. They are looking uh, into consideration if the genes, uh, if like gene A activates gene B or inhibits gene B. There, there is a, another method where they look at the overlap, the genes in the overlap, and they look at the functional uh, relationships between the genes in the overlap. So if the genes in the overlap, they are connected to each other, they would, they, they would put a weight to the enrichment score. So this connection would increase the enrichment score compared to the background genes that would be less connected. This is also an interesting uh, method, I think. And more, more or more tools are starting to include some network visualization in their output. So you will see, uh, I think about a cluster profiler in R, then you will see you, you do your enrichment test and then you, you will have like a, a little, of a network visualization. So if you want more uh, detail on this advanced topic, then you can go um, and look at this nature method paper. So two last tips. So um, be precise at each step of your analysis, especially step one, when you uh, select your genes for your analysis and try to answer one biological question at a time. And at the um, very last two slides, uh, if you want to know more about uh, enrichment analysis, I really like this example from StatQuest. So you can look at the video. I think it's very visual. So basically, they they have this bag of elements, elements and they say this is all the genes in the genome. This is the background. And all the pathway are uh, the different color, color of the MNMs. And this is the gene list. And we see for sure that our gene list is enriched in the blue uh, in the blue MNMs pathway. So I think, I mean, I really like StatQuest. It's very easy to understand. And the same for the FGR. I think they have a good explanation of FGR. It means that you know in your in your output you have a mix a, a distribution you have the true positive that are mixed with the random that we could not discard so the random results are still there and if we could remove the random results from the true positive then uh, we will have um, only a true positive and better accurate results and this is what the FDR is trying to do. Okay, so thank you to the sponsors.